Welcome to Dodgers Dogs as part of the Dodgers Daily Network. Casey Porter here, so glad you decided to tune in. Joined, as I always am, by Austin Brubaker. Really cool show today, Austin. Tell us all about it. Yeah, no, this is a really cool show because a lot of times on Dodgers Daily, especially during the offseason, we get a chance to highlight the major league club or talking about all the different rumors or the big signings that the Dodgers have had, which there certainly have been a lot. But this is kind of going to the root of what we are at Dodgers Daily, which we love talking about the farm system. We love talking about the prospects and not just the prospects on all of the top lists. We love talking about guys throughout the system because each person in this system plays a key role that helps develop a culture that is that they are intel- in, incredibly talented on their own and they can work to help build up the foundation of the Los Angeles Dodgers. So we're going to be getting into perhaps a lot of different guys that you might not have never heard of, but are very talented. There's a lot of reason to be excited about them, either for their future for the Los Angeles Dodgers or for whatever the Dodgers have planned for them. Each one of these guys is incredibly talented, and even though you probably haven't heard of them, you will hear about them because there are a lot of major league players that we're going to be talking about. So these are guys that are not on the top 30 prospects list, according to the MLB pipeline. Really, that's the only one that I use. But they would be guys that, in our opinions, would be in top, th- maybe top 10 list in other organizations that don't have quite as much depth. So, hey, these might be guys that end up helping L.A. someday or guys that are actual uh, trade pieces to get you the bigger pieces down the line like we've seen so far this year, like at Yorbet Vivas, that type of deal. So these are guys that are massively underrated because they're in an organization like the Dodgers that just are so loaded with talent. So we're super excited to bring you these guys. Hopefully you enjoy it. And so here we go. So the first guy we're going to talk about today is known as Gator, a young man that actually did not even get drafted out of Hofstra College in New York City. He was an undrafted free agent. He said, tell me where to sign. I will go anywhere you need me to, and I just want to play baseball. Played for his dad in the Summer League and his brother in 2020, and so had a really cool experience there in the in the North in the SoCal League. They call that the uh, the, the league of not the SoCal League. They call it the the NorCal League, something like that over there in the Virginia area. But this is Austin Gothier, and I know uh, Austin. This is Austin Brubaker, and then I'm talking about Austin Gothier. You know all about him, all of his statistics. I've seen him a million different times. Talked to him on three different occasions for interviews, several other occasions beyond that. But Austin Gothier, one of Dodgers Daily's favorites. Yeah, certainly one of Dodgers Daily's favorites. And it goes for a very good reason why Austin Gothier is one of our favorites. You just watch his style of play. He's kind of a little bit of a throwback of a style of player. And I think that has to do with he has a combination of a great eye but also incredible bat-to-ball skills. And that is reflected by some of his walks and strikeout numbers. You're talking about this past season combined high A and double A, a 17.3% walk percentage, which is very much well above any sort of average, as well as a strikeout percentage that is well below average. You're talking about a 14.5% strikeout percentage. That combination in today's game of having more walks and strikeouts is not seen often at all. And you combine that with this past season, he had a level of production that is well beyond uh, the scale of a lot of other players. You're talking about a 151 WRC+. plus. The cumulative component of that is 37.2 weighted runs above average. He was 51% better than the league average player. And actually... It's funny enough that we're talking about Gator because I've been doing some research because I wanted to see exactly how rare that is to have a player that has more walks and strikeouts and with a WRC plus of 150 or more. And if you're going back, which on fan graphs right now, you can really only go back to 2006 gathering minor league data. There have been only 21 players since 2006 in the minor league level who have had more walks and strikeouts 
a WRC plus of 150, and 500 plate appearances. Let me repeat that again. There have only been 21 players in minor league baseball since 2006 who fit the criteria that Austin Gothier has done. Now, let's say that's a lot of plate appearances, even though there have been four, uh, just under 5,000 seasons of plate appearances with that much. Let's say that you lower that to 400 plate appearances. There have been only 31 players, including Austin Gothier, to fit 150 WRC+. Plus more walks than strikeouts, and 400 plate appearances. And that is roughly about 0.3% of minor league players. You're talking about an elite player who showed an elite level of production, which I'm doing a little bit more research right now, seems to be a very good indicator of a big league player. And there have been a lot of all-star quality players with that those categories as well. A lot to be excited about looking at the numbers of Austin Gothier. And another thing about Austin, this is him at the Great Lakes level, but he did not skip a meet, beat making it to AA. He is a guy that in 2022 actually hit the ball for a percentage to the opposite field. His opposite field percentage was higher than his pull percentage. As you can see in most of these videos, most of his hits, he uses the middle of the field to the opposite field as well or better than anybody in the game. You can see right there he can run. So I love the way that he stays inside the baseball. He is a bat-to-ball skill guy. He is a contact guy, the exact type of dynamic player that I have been wanting the Dodgers to have, and he has been very, very good at it. So Austin Gothier was yeah. the first young man that's not on the MLB Pipeline Dodgers top 30 prospects list that we wanted to cover today. The next guy, one of my absolute favorites of all time, and he is just absolutely a Dodgers daily favorite, Braden Fisher. You're seeing right here the young man out of League City, Texas. My Oklahoma State Cowboys were in Houston last night and beat Texas A&M. That's in that League City, Texas area. So Braden Fisher, what a wonderful young man. This guy, okay, over 50 of his per. Uh, per of his appearances this year were multi-innings. So this is a guy that could be an opener. He's a guy that can be a middle relief guy. And then also, Austin, if you evaluate, just go back to all my Twitters and do an advanced search, all the Dodger Daily tweets about Braden Fisher from the last two years, you'll find that when the game is on the line, that's actually when Braden Fisher does his best work. So this dude is absolutely nails under pressure. He's tall. He has the big, he has good extension. He has the good curveball, the good slider, the good fastball. He is just a wonderful young man. The most, and I'm saying that confidently, the most versatile pitcher in the system, hands down, in terms of how he was used last year. So I love Braden Fisher. There's that big hook. Yeah, no, Braden Fisher showed a lot of growth this past season. You're talking about a guy who is very versatile in the type of roles that he can have. He can go one inning, he can get you two innings as well. Uh, he's shown a lot of, had a lot of key moments, and that's because he's been able to strike out a lot of guys. He did not stay long at the high A level during this season because he was striking everybody out at the high a level move that over to uh move that to double a tulsa and was still striking out a lot of guys you're talking about a 31 percent strikeout percentage mm -hmm. in tulsa you're talking about getting swings and misses a little over 15 percent of the time being in the top 20 in the texas league being top eight in the los angeles Dar dodgers farm system i think with a lot of these guys and a lot of these arms that we're going to be talking about he has electric stuff I think it's about making sure that he's able to command it a little bit more. That's just going to elevate him to the next level. And Braden Fisher has the stuff to be able to strike out a lot of guys and get a lot of guys out. And I think with his versatility, that just adds so much more value to the pitcher that he is, which he is a very talented pitcher. And he is just an absolute wonderful young man. Every time that I have messaged and needed anything from him, whether it be a quote or there's Jose Ramos. I hope he has a great year this year. And coming in right there, that's Yusni Diaz. He actually signed a – as a he's a free agent. Now he became a free agent in the offseason. Braden Fisher just wanted – you see that big, big, big hook. And he actually didn't ever – he never had that curveball. He had a slider, and he wanted to add a little bit more depth to his slider – so spring training before the 2022 season, 
he was working in in a bullpen, and one of his pitching coaches just said, "Hey, just try to throw it like you're throwing a curveball to add depth to your slider." He did that six days in a row and ended up with that big hook, that big curveball that you're seeing right there. So, Braden Fisher, he is just simply a fantastic pitcher. I think he'll probably, uh, who knows? I mean, he's one of those guys that could start either in double-A, kind of like he did last year with high-A Great Lakes, and be in double-A for like a week or two, and then go to triple-A. That, that's irrelevant. He's going to be in triple-A for the vast majority of next year. I just can't see any other way. And so, super excited about Braden Fisher. So the next guy we want to talk about, Austin, one of my most favorite young men. Hey, I love these guys that just are workhorses. Antonio Knowles out of Key West. His slider is so good, I actually gave it a name. I call it the Conkinator uh, this, so, because they're the conks there in Key West, and he's so proud of his high school. Now, this is from the Great Lakes action. He was in Tulsa last year, but I just wanted to show you this hook. We struck out the side in this video, so I wanted to start with that video there, but I will get to his double-A action here in just a minute but i wanted to show you that nasty slider that antonio knowles has yeah no and that slider is nasty coming from experience being able to watch that from directly behind home plate on several different occasions watching the gray lakes loons yeah antonio knowles especially when you we talk about a lot of his numbers when he was in great lakes were incredibly impressive especially this season you're talking about 153 era 368 uh, FIP. You're talking about a 307 expected FIP in his uh, high A appearances. He's a guy that when he's on, and especially when that slider is on, which it is really devastating and nasty to hitters, he can strike out a lot yeah. of guys too. You're talking about uh, 12.74 strikeouts per nine in Great Lakes. You're talking about a combination of strikeouts, but also he's able to generate a fair amount of ground balls too, which is really deadly when you're able to strike guys out and also generate ground balls that are typically weaker contact. I think with Antonio Knowles, he has that electric stuff. He has a lot of tools to be able to be a really good, really solid pitcher. He can throw that fastball, throw that slider, and that slider is going to carry him a long ways as he continues to progress in this system. Yeah, no doubt about that. And just another wonderful young man. Anytime you ever need anything, he is right there. He answers. Look at that big slider that is just a big time pitch and the thing about that is he like there we've seen it to lefties and righties it's ambidextrous you've seen that he can throw it to both both sides of the plate and then he can throw it just kind of to get me over to get it for a strike and then you've seen him add depth to it to get the strikeout pitch and there's a change up right there for Antonio Knowles and he actually threw his four seam quite a bit more last year and the thing about Antonio just like Braden it's all about him being in the strike zone when he is in the strike zone, he is very, very good because then he can live on that slider and he gets a lot of swing and miss just like that right there, whether it be a lefty or a righty, that kind of swing and miss on that back foot. He gets a lot of that, but then sometimes he floats out of the zone in periods of the season. So what you see when you look at his game logs are like he'll have 10 or 11 outings in a row where he's striking everybody out, doesn't give up a run, he'll go on a massive heater, then all of a sudden he'll have a week or two where he struggles a little bit. So the thing about Antonio Knowles, consistency in the strike zone, that lead that's going to lead to consistent success over the long run of a season. It's definitely there at the top end. It's a matter of if he can master that consistency. Once he does that, he will be major league ready at that point. So another friend of the Dodgers Daily family here is Jake Polarski, the 101 Express, who took the Dodgers organization by storm last year with his plus 100 mile hour fastball. He is found by Joza, uh, Jonah Rosenthal. He was actually playing independent ball. He went D3 out of high school, D3 out of high school, then spent his last year at the Citadel, and then from the Citadel did not get drafted. It was that 2020 deal to where there was only five rounds. There was a lot of really good players that normally would get drafted that had to go Indy. He's one of them. And so he went Indy for about a year and a half, got with Tread Athletics, increased his velo. The next thing you know, he's throwing 100-plus miles an hour. Last year, he got off to a blazing start going through about halfway through June. He was giving up no runs. The fastball was up over 100. He struggled a touch for a couple of weeks, and then lo and behold, he got hurt for about a month and a half. 
And so it was kind of like one of those deals where he had coming out of spring training, he had a massive amount of momentum. And then the the season, he carried that into the season, carried that all the way into June, and then that momentum just stopped. And so he did not make it up to AAA. He would have made it up to AAA otherwise. He did come back towards the end of the season, got a little momentum back. But Jake Polarski, he's a guy that I could definitely see you know, threaten the major leagues this next year. Yeah, no, for sure. He definitely can be threatening that. I think he is one of those guys who was a phenomenal, one of the best, if not the best find for the Dodgers during the previous offseason when they were able to sign him and really find him uh, from any ball. And he just performed, especially when he got called up to Great Lakes. I remember seeing him. He was part of the first win for the Great Lakes students, pitching one and 1.2 innings and getting four strikeouts and just being dominant versus a team that the Loons competed with during the Dayton Dragons all season. He's a guy that you talked about. He has elite, elite below on his fastball. And when he is right, and especially when he is in the zone and when he's healthy, he can strike a ton of guys out. You're talking about the high level, talking about strikeout percentages close to that of a Kyle Hurt, which is just phenomenal. The I think the a lot of the issue was he was just dealing with some inconsistencies. He was battling, I'm sure, through some injuries as well, uh, which led to some of the poorer numbers in Double A Tulsa. But you're still talking about an incredible talent that has all of the stuff to be a back end closer type of a reliever because of the velocity, because of the movement on a lot of his pitchers. He has the tools. He has the stuff. Now it's for the uh, coaching staffs, for the pitching coaches to be able to help work with him, to continue to help develop him, to turn him into that major league relief pitcher that he is going to be one day. Kind of has some goose gossage feel to him just when I watch him. So, hey, we're going to transition back over now, Austin, one of our favorite players, back to the position player side of things. And, hey, you remember this one, don't you? The walk-off triple, or actually the game-winning triple, I should say, for T.Y. Taylor Young, young man who stole 56 bases for the Loons, got off to a massively so slow start. He is the all-time lead. Yeah, that's funny, isn't it? He is the all-time hits leader at Louisiana Tech. He is just absolutely an absolute favorite of theirs just got married over this past off season so he's super happy about that and he is just one another one of those bat to ball guys just what i call grub worms kind of like in the austin gothier mold middle infield type played college or played shortstop in college just like gothier did just like gothier probably profiles more as a second baseman at a major league level but taylor young one of our favorites Yeah, he's one of our favorites, and it's especially because this past season, he was the heart and soul of the Great Lakes Loons during that phenomenal season that they had this previous season. You you mentioned it, he had 56 stolen bases, which is incredibly impressive, but I think what's perhaps even more impressive is if we look at a statistic called weighted stolen bases, which weighted stolen bases attempts to quantify the ability to steal bases but also at a good rate, meaning you want to steal a lot of bases, but you also don't want to be caught stealing a lot. Taylor Young had 56 stolen bases. He was only caught five of those times. And if you interact with him, I'm sure he'll say that a couple of those were stolen bases where he wasn't even really trying to get thrown out or they were part of some other situation with that. And what that led to is that led to a 7.6 weighted stolen base, which in the last season in all of minor league baseball was sixth, which means he was the sixth best person at stealing bases this previous season. Now, that would be impressive if enough if you didn't even look at the offensive component that he adds to that, which he certainly adds a ton of talent. You're talking about a guy with an elite eye on the baseball. You're talking about a 15% walk percentage, which was 47% better than the Midwest League average. You're also talking about that comparing that with only about a 20.6 strikeout percentage, which still was 15% better than the Midwest League average, and a 115 WRC+. plus. So those tools, the ability to get a lot of walks, to be able to set up a lot of the bases, 
I think really sets a really good elite floor that he can have a lot of production. And if you look at the second half of his season, six of his seven home runs came in the later half of the season. So if you're worried a little bit about some of the power production he has, he was starting to turn on a little bit of that power towards the second half of the season. Once the weather got a little bit warmer, I know early in the season, it's pretty chilly here in Michigan, uh, but he can get, He's an incredible athlete. He's an elite, elite stolen base steal person who steals bases. And he'll do stuff like he'll do delayed steals. He'll try to have a lot of fun. And with Taylor Young, he's just he was the heart and soul of the team. He was leading by example. He was telling the people on deck while he was in the box how the pitches were going in what he was seeing at the plate he was doing all the little things right that you want out of a baseball player that just looking at the back of the baseball card you might not see he is a very talented very good fundamentally sound baseball player no doubt about it and just communicate with him yesterday going to talk to him sometime next week I'll have that interview posted here in a couple of weeks i have do have one interview and a feature article on him. This is another guy. Get to know this guy's name. This is Jack Dreyer, the Maytag. He can do a Rubik's Cube in 14 seconds, and he is the best chess player in the entire organization, which tells you he likes to strategize. He loves strategy. And as you saw this last year, Austin, he absolutely loves the huge moment. And you say, well, who is Jack Dreyer? Where did he come from? Well, look at him, man. He got the, some of the biggest moments for the Loons in that run to the championship game and the championship series last year. He went to Iowa. Okay, so when he was in high school at Iowa, he struck out 13 hitters in the state finals game, which is a record for the Iowa High School Athletics Association ever for one game in a state finals game. His dad, Steve Dreyer, actually pitched for the Rangers, and he actually was the first reliever for Nolan Ryan and Nolan Ryan's last game he ever pitched. Believe that or not. And Steve Dreyer, hey, how about this, Austin? He was actually on the last Oklahoma City AAA team in Oklahoma City that won the PCL. You know, the, team, the, the Oklahoma City Dodgers this year, they won the PCL this year. Well, the last time they did it was in 1996. And Jack Dreyer, the young man that you're seeing right here, his dad was on that team with Pudge Rodriguez and Rusty Greer and, and Juan Gonzalez, Juan Gon, and that whole group. And so he comes from lineage of major leagues. So he went to Iowa, Austin, and then he ended up getting hurt. Okay, so he pitched his first year. He was, a matter of fact, I got to see him pitch against Oklahoma State, and he completely shoved against my beloved Cowboys. That's when I first knew who he was. So when that when it, when I saw his name this year, I was like, oh hell yeah, that's that guy. I remember shoving against OSU a couple years ago, right? And so then he had a really good first year there in 2019. Then 2020 hit. 2022 he gets hurt okay and so really this past season was the first time that he had thrown since 2019 so i mean you're talking about a guy that that yes he did come out of nowhere but hey he has everything that you need to be a just an awesome awesome left-handed relief pitcher and i asked him he does think that you know he was about 93 94 as far as sitting with his fastball, he thinks as he gets further away from his Tommy John surgeries, that surgery that that he could sit 96. So this is a guy with a huge future. You're in on the ground floor with this guy. I told you about Justin Robleski. You're in on the ground floor for him. Now everybody knows about Robo, right? I'm telling you about Jack Dreyer right now. Yes, and I think what is really cool, especially with some of the footage that you're watching, is you are watching some of the most critical or some very high leverage moments in here. We're not just talking about guys with a lot of numbers throughout the season. We're also talking about a lot of these guys performing in huge situations, like the footage that you're seeing right now. That was a really intense series against the Dayton Dragons against a hitter that destroyed the loons all season you're also talking about Jack Dreyer who competed against and finished off for the Great Lakes loons the game three against Fort Wayne to send the loons to the second ever Midwest League Championship he is one of the best relievers that the high level Great Lakes loons have ever had he has had one of the most successful season you're talking about the numbers ERA 2.3 FIP 2.94, uh, XFIP 
for you're talking about a Sierra of 3.49. And this is because he has an elite strikeout percentage. And it seemed like he kept getting better and better and more comfortable as the season got along. He get getting more accustomed to the level. He was able to figure out hitters really well. Uh, kept striking out guys. And he was also Ugh. somebody who was elite at limiting the amount of home runs. Did you see You're that like curveball about- and that back foot slider on back-to-back pitches? That is just dirty to a right-hander. Oh, yeah. No, and uh, it's funny because I'm actually there behind home plate yeah. for that one. Uh, but he's talking about uh, .16 home runs per nine, which is 80% better than the league average pitcher at the Midwest League. That's just phenomenal. You're talking about only giving up an ISO of .064 you're talking about a really elite pitcher who was relied on at the biggest moments for the Great Lakes Loons, the high A affiliate. And so you're talking about a guy who, if he can handle the moments at that level, he can continue to grow. He can continue to develop at whatever level he's going to be put on. Jack Dreyer has nasty stuff, and I think it can be even better. And we're talking about well, especially with all of these guys on the pitching side, this seems to be a trend with the Los Angeles Dodgers. If he can keep it in the zone, which he was able to do more later in the season, if he can keep it in the zone, he his stuff is so good, he can get a ton of hitters out. Uh, so with Jack Dreyer, the May tag, uh, somebody who very much popular and very much a leader in the clubhouse for the Great Lakes Loons and for the community that they have, He's such a good person and such a very talented pitcher as well. Yeah, and you might wonder, well, of course, yeah, Dreyer, Maytag, that's where you got. Yes, it does rhyme there. But really, what the reason why his the the real reason why his nickname is, and we're we're, we're transitioning here to Michael Hobbs. The real reason why his nickname is Maytag because Maytags are reliable. And everybody he has been, everybody he has ever come in contact to, the first thing they'll say about him, yes, he's talented, but he is the most reliable human being you will ever meet. And he is just off the charts intelligent. The Rubik's Cube thing, chess, all of it. He's the smartest human being probably in the entire system. So love Jack Dreyer. Who you're looking at here, they did devastating slider slash, just call it a breaking ball because it's a hybrid type pitch for Michael Hobbs. This is a young man that it was the all-time saves leader at St. Mary's College. St. Mary's College is the same university that produced Tony Gonsolin, right? Chris Campos, who is in the organization right now, played shortstop behind behind uh, Michael Hobbs when he was at St. Mary's. So this is a say St. Mary's has put out some big-time pitchers over the years. And to be the all-time saves leader, that tells you everything that you need to know about Michael Hobbs. He's another guy that loves the big moments. I mean, the more smack talk, the more you bump your gums against this guy, don't do that. You bump your gums against Michael Hobbs, you raise the adrenaline level for him, you are out. Period. End of discussion. I know you've seen that. With Look at that hook right there. Woo! I love that hook. Look at that. I love He They had been talking Jack all night long to Michael Hobbs and he just absolutely shoved it and let them know about it I get fired up every time I watch this young man pitch yeah Hobbsy is just he's just he's amazing and super fun talented pitcher to watch and you'd mentioned that that breaking ball that slider whatever you want to call it um I had I have chance to be able to watch that and especially if you're able to watch it from the side view which if you sit over by the team dugout uh, you're able to see that just, it <laughs> it is so cool to be able to watch it because it looks like it's going up in the air and it looks like it almost stops before it breaks down a whole lot. It has a ton of break and hitters have fits with that pitch. No, Hobbsy is a very good pitcher and you put him in a lot of big moments. He has been able to succeed. You talk about that first series against Fort Wayne in the Great Lakes Loons playoffs. He was the guy who closed off game number two in a run run game. You're talking about a guy who had a 120 ERA plus with the 3.12 ERA in the Midwest League this past season. You're talking about a guy who mm-hmm. generated swings and misses 15% of the time, which is very well above league average. 
28.3% strikeout percentage, 20% better. He has really nasty stuff, and he has been relied on in the big moments for a large part of the season for the Great Lakes Loons. Going back to some of the history that he has, going back to college, he is a big-time, big-moment pitcher, and he delivered more times than not for the Great Lakes Loons, and I think in the future he's going to be able to deliver a lot for the Tulsa Drillers, Oklahoma City Dodgers, hopefully for the L.A. Dodgers or whatever MLB organization that he is a part of. Yep, and not a guy that's going to necessarily light up the radar gun. He's not going to hit 100 miles an hour, but his ball moves so much. You've seen it, Austin. And the way that he's able to use his breaking ball in so many different ways that by the time he does get to his four seam, it's all about perception, right? So if you throw a breaking ball, breaking ball, breaking ball, you're kind of pitching backwards. By the time you get to that 94, 95, 96, with the movement he has on it and with that kind of herky-jerky motion, see how well he hides the ball? I want to show you what may – okay, so it's one thing to have velo, but whenever you're able to do it – now watch how he's hiding the ball right here. See how the ball is still hidden? And, and really until – I mean, you just don't see the ball until it's right up on top of you. So it's very, very, very deceptive. So although it's not necessarily the 100 miles an hour, it does have very, very good what's called perceived velocity to it. And so that's why he gets a lot of the swing and miss. And he is just one of the most competitive dudes that I have ever seen pit. So super excited about him. So let's get to the next guy. I know this is a guy, Austin, that you can't wait to talk about because he has always been a tall, long, lefty, that kind of gives you the Rawlis Chapman vibes, but, you know, he's kind of been inconsistent. And then last year, the Loon said, you know what, to hell with it. We're just going to throw him out there in the ninth inning, and we're going to see if he can sink and swim, right? And he definitely swam last year. Benoni Robles, hey, man, the rubber met the road for him last year. Yeah, it certainly did. And we talked about a guy earlier on this list, Jake Polarski. He kind of came in and took over that closer role. Well, it was very apparent very early into his run that he was ready for the double A level. And so they needed some sort of end of the game closer. And Benoni Robles came in, who had struggled early in the season but then came in and was put into the some of the biggest moments of the game. Boy, did he deliver. He's big, tall, left-handed pitcher. You're talking about a guy who was put into some of the, like Jack Dreyer, the biggest moments of the season for the Great Lakes Loons. You're talking about the guy who, in the championship series, closed off game two against some of the best position player prospects for the Minnesota Twins. You're talking about he got out Emmanuel Classe. He went against the Midwest League MVP, Clay Rosario. You're talking about Andrew Cosetti, Joel Ortega. He was able to succeed in a lot of those big moments. He had 12 different saves, I believe. And you're also talking about a guy who not just had an ERA of 3.86. You look at his underlying metrics. They're even better, FIP and XFIP. He had a 2.78 Sierra as well. Uh, he's a guy who is able to get a lot of hitters out, and it's because he strike likes a lot of these other guys. He strikes out a ton of batters. You're talking about last year, a 38.7 strikeout percentage. That is insane. That is 64% better than the league average as far as his strikeout percentage. Uh, you're talking about a guy that doesn't give up too much hard contact as well. He was able to limit opponent's slugging percentage to just 298. He is a really good, really talented reliever. And from the left-handed side, he's able to generate a ton of swing and miss, as you can see right here. Benoni Robles is so talented. Another guy that was just must-see TV for the Great Lakes Loons, no doubt about it, Juan Mario. Let me get up to him right here. Juan Mario was super fun. A guy that runs hot, man. This is a guy that runs off of adrenaline. He runs off of emotions, and he will let you know where his emotions are at. I don't want to say he wears them on his sleeve, but he lets you know when he's fired up. He runs hot, and he can throw the ball right at 100 miles an hour. That is no kidding. There's 98 right there, but I have seen him, and you have two, Austin. Heat up. There's 101 right there. You just saw it on the radar gun. Juan Mario had been fighting injury, came back last year. This is a guy that's fun to watch because he rides those emotions and he throws that huge fastball. Yeah, it is electric velocity. And when you see 
uh, Juan Mario go out and compete, especially in the big moments. He really dives into that and embraces the role. I'm reminded of what he did in game two against the Cedar Rapids Colonels in the Midwest League Championship in the eighth inning when the game was getting tight. When you're going up and have a game three potentially on the line, he came in in that eighth inning and was just able to dominate and showed an attitude of aggressiveness during that. He was so fired up during that. That was really cool. But with that electric velo that he's as, he's able to generate a lot of swings and misses as well. Talking about a guy with another guy over 30% strikeout percentage, 31.6. He had a FIP, uh, an XFIP, I should say, of 3.64 as well. Gen- able to get swings and misses 15% of the time. But with that as well, he's also able to, similar to Antonio Knowles, get a good healthy amount of ground balls as well so if he's able to keep it in the zone he can get a lot of swings and misses and he can also be a guy who can generate some more ground balls as well able to limit some of the damage he has electric stuff and he has the attitude of a big time reliever yeah no doubt about it he he absolutely is he he, he has the presence i think that's a great way to put it that he does have the presence of a big time major leaguer. Hey, I'm going to throw a, cur- a, a little bit of a curveball to you here. I know it, it won't affect you whatsoever. We're going to talk about Damon Keith next. Damon Keith is a young man that has elite exit velos. Okay. He strikes out quite a bit. If you're going to ask, hey, what's keeping him down? Why is the batting average not here or there? It's because he strikes out too much. Going to get that right out of the way, right off the top. But Damon Keith, this is a young man that out of Cal Baptist that can flat hit. Okay, and when he does hit it, I mean, I think he hit like a 115-mile-hour single this year. I have it on my Twitter. So, Damon Keith, just a a big-time arm and a great athlete. He's like one of the fastest players in the entire system. So, Damon Keith wanted to cover him. Yeah, and you mentioned that him being one of the fastest guys in the system. You, Brad Tunney, I know, mentioned on a broadcast that he was one of, I believe, the second fastest guy on the Great Lakes Loons team, which means that there could be more potential for him. Like Robert Vizuas was able to tap into some more stolen bases during this past season. He could potentially tap into that as well. With Damon Keith, though, I think the main thing that distinguishes him, he's got that insane exit velo, and when he's able That's to hit there. some fly balls with that, he can be – he can hit for a lot of power. You're talking about going into the season. He had an ISO of around 0.2 consistently this past season. It dipped down a little bit, but I have no doubt that he would be able to regenerate that in the past. And if he's able to increase that power output going forward, if he's able to stay a little bit more disciplined like he has been in the past and be able to have a little bit more back to ball, he can be an elite player he's you talked about him having a really good arm in the outfield as well you're talking about a guy with a ton of tools dk is really good really talented player and has been an anchor in the great lakes loons lineup he will continue to move his talents forward into double a tulsa this next season i actually shorted him a mile per hour his single he had 116 116 mile an hour single this year so damon keith he is a wonderful young outfield prospect okay this next guy one of our favorites actually hit for the cycle and his name is griffin lockwood powell man all right here we go we're going to actually watch this cycle right here we're going to go through every hit of griffin lockwood powell's cycle and he did it on a friday and like the friday before that he had like two or three home runs so it was like every friday it seemed like he went off there for a while yeah, no, it, it, and what's funny about this is I get the, when they go to Lansing, I get to go to a good majority of those games. I was at seven or eight of the games that the Great Lakes, out of the 12 games that the Loons played in Lansing. This was one of the games that I had to miss for some reason. I was really disappointed, but super happy for GLP, for Locke, Griffin Lockwood Power. He is a really good, really talented, underrated part of this deep class of catchers that the Dodgers have in their system he's has a lot of power he has a lot of discipline and he has a lot of underrated tools that that aren't appreciated enough you talk about him as a catcher he what probably was the best 
catcher at throwing out runners for the Great Lakes Loons. He actually didn't get a ton of opportunities at catcher. He played about 18 games out there, but he threw out 10 of 25 runners. He threw out 40% of the runners that were attempting to steal, which was well above the league average for that. You're talking about a guy in combination with that is very productive with the bat. He's a guy who generates a a lot of walks, 15.2 walk percentage. Talking about a guy with a 127 WRC plus, a 198 ISO. He has a ton of power. He has a lot of plate discipline, and he only striked out 22% of the time, which if you're talking about a power type hitter or a guy who's able to get a lot of extra base hits, that's not too bad. And he was he just continued to prove that he can be productive. And even though the Dodgers or the Great Lakes Loons had Dalton Rushing and Yaner Fernandez, who are two elite uh, prospects in the system and two very well-deserving guys to get playing time, even though both of those guys played catcher, GLP was still able to find ways to get on the field and still be productive. And every time he was in the lineup, you could expect him to do something good that would be beneficial for the team. Yeah, so I know what it was. He hit a, he hit a grand slam on a Friday afternoon. And then seven days later on the next Friday, he hit for the cycle. So it was like, man, dude, it, when it's on Fridays, man, Griffin Lockwood pal absolutely shows up. So I like, love this young man. Played at his college baseball at Central Michigan, so he's just a blue collar, just a, a guy that earns everything he gets. And man, he is very, very, very underrated. Here is another young man that, hey, in 2022, actually had the highest strikeout per rate per innings of any pitcher in all of baseball. Now, obviously, like every other prospect in the Dodgers organization, the key for Ben Harris, the young man that went to the University of Georgia is to keep the ball in the strike zone. But when it's in the strike zone, it's super, super, super de deceptive. Fangraphs did a, a nice article on how he deceives hitters by hiding the ball. Ben Harris has a lot of swing and miss strikeout stuff, Austin. Yeah, he has a lot of swing and miss strikeout stuff. And I think this, I think it is, it can be easy for Dodgers fans to forget if you had, if you knew about Ben Harris, just how good he was in 2022. And Fangraphs, as you mentioned, did a great article by David Loria on how Ben Harris became the best under the radar pitching prospect in Major League Baseball. And that is because of his 45% strikeout percentage in 2022, which, as you alluded to, led all of minor league baseball. And that is because he is very deceptive on the mound. He's able to hide the baseball well, which means the perceived velocity is so much greater than what the actual velocity is. So right here, and you don't see it. Man, when he's able... I'm yeah, and you can kind of see with the footage right now, just him being able to hide. Hitters have fits over that and I think that is something that he really leaned into and was so good on in 2022 fast forward into 2023 it was a little bit more of a struggle at times and I think that had to do with he was just walking a lot of hitters as well he was didn't have quite the control that he had in 2022 but I think if he's able to generate that if he's able to make make those adjustments be able to do that he has the swing and miss stuff and even last year he still had a 31.4 strikeout percentage he still is able to get a lot of strikeouts and so i think it's very important not to forget one of if not the best relief pitcher in all of Ma minor league baseball in 2022 you should it's you should feel confident going forward that he's at least able to generate some of that and he has the skill set to be able to lean into some of the things that he did so well in 2022 and so i look forward and i expect really good things from ben harris in 2024 and you're talking about for the Dodgers with left-handed relievers. He's a guy who could be sneaky as far as forcing his way closer and closer, especially if he starts to replicate some of the things he did in 2022. Dodgers fans should not forget about Ben Harris. No doubt about that, and we are back live here in Austin. That was a lot of fun. This has been a show we've been looking forward to. We, we love all the top prospects. We love all the prospects, but... Really, if you follow Dodgers Daily, we're one. Tim Rogers does a great job at Dodgers 2082. 
We're, we, we like to cover everybody equally. I don't like to look at these guys like, well, he's a top 30. I like to just look at them and see how they, how they play and, my, and make up your own mind who you think is the best player. So this was a video that we've really been looking forward to, to highlight these guys, to show just how good we think they are, and to put a show together for them. So this was a lot of fun. Yeah, and this doesn't even come close to capturing all the guys in the farm system as well. There's a lot of other guys that we can talk about and that I'm sure that we will talk about. I'm sure there will be part two, maybe a part three as well to this video, just highlighting mm -hmm. some of the really good guys that are in this system. Because you, as you mentioned right there, every single one of these guys are incredibly talented and they each have their individual skills that can help elevate them to higher and higher levels and hopefully all reach the major leagues as well. So it's been an absolute fun show. This is this is the type of stuff that just fires me up. And this is the type of stuff that I, throughout the season, throughout the baseball season, get to watch the most of. And so I'm really excited to be able to introduce to the growing audience that we have at Dodgers Daily to a lot of these guys. Uh, be sure to keep following these guys as they continue to make their progressions throughout the minor leagues because each one of these guys could play a role for the Los Angeles Dodgers, whether that is for the Los Angeles Dodgers or whether that is part of of some sort of trade package to potentially get more major league help. Each one of these guys and their roles are incredibly important as far as the foundation for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And they're also super fun to be able to watch play baseball as well. Minor league baseball is still really much fun. So we're more than happy to be able to cover this. No doubt about that. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Don't forget to click that like button. Make sure you subscribe and make sure your notifications are turned on. So until next time, go Dodgers!